Jesus told his disciples, upon this rock, I will build my church. And then listen to what he said. He says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That phrase, gates of hell, think about that. Gates, what does that imply? What what Jesus isn't saying is, hey, the the church is going to survive the attacks of the devil. No, he said the gates of hell, that's the defensive. Jesus is saying, hey, the gates of hell. He says the church is on the offensive. The church was designed to, to storm the gates of hell together, and Satan will not survive it in the end. This is what Jesus has for the church. This is what he intended for the church, and I believe in faith that together in Christ, we can once again truly thrive as a church. And that's what Thrive 2024 is all about. We mentioned last month that one of those initiatives is moving forward with our phase one of our facility enhancement uh, project. And to be able to update uh, some of our main spaces, some of the the flooring in here, some some of the walls in here, as well as some other key spaces in our lobby and and around our church, um, to to be able to uh, um, just update those. And and, um, I mentioned that uh, last month that we already launched uh, the Thrive uh, Giving Campaign, and we already opened that up. And I wanted to announce that uh, our goal was $15,000 on the low end. And really the point of that low number was to be able to say, hey, just to continue with phase one uh, with, with the updated cost from inflation, most of these quotes we got were over a year old. Um, and then also hopefully uh, we're, we're getting quotes still on, uh, um, on this ceiling in here as well. And so to add some things to that. So that, that low end is hopefully to cover some of that. And then that higher number, I wanted to, to put it out there to say, listen, if we um, can, can raise that high, higher number, we can go ahead as well and be able to move forward with phase two. Uh, in other words, until we hit that n- higher number, um, we're not going to be able to ma- move forward with phase two, which is focused on uh, updating our space for our kids, our, our nurseries, our, our preschool areas. And uh, we know how important that is for uh, a church to have nice space for young families to drop off their kids. And, and, uh, and, and so this is our Thrive campaign, and I'm excited to share that, that up to this date, in just the last few weeks, we have raised already $7,800. Thank you. Thanks for your generosity for that. We're praising the Lord for that. Thank you. We're excited. Uh, movement is beginning to happen. And let me just remind you that as the Lord leads you over the next several months to give to what the Lord is doing here. Uh, you can do that in two ways. You can give to uh, through our, the offering envelope. You, uh, just make sure to write on there. Uh, if you don't write anything, it's just going to go to our general fund. Um, but but it, make sure to write on there uh, on top of your regular giving to write uh, Thrive Campaign on that envelope. And then secondly, you can give online through our church website, uh, calvarylilburn.org. And when you click give, uh, you, there's a fund you can select. Uh, and that says, again, Thrive Campaign. So just wanted to, as the Lord leads you to let you know about those two ways to give to this. I truly believe with all that's going on in our world, the church, that we as a church can and we must thrive here in our city for years to come for the sake of the gospel. The question is, how? How how do we get from a place that we are now to a place where we are truly thriving as a church. Well, that's exactly why over the next few months, we're going to be diving into the book of Nehemiah together. So the book of Nehemiah tells us the story, a true story of God working in the lives of his people, leading them from a state of surviving to a place where they were thriving. Look in Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Now, Nehemiah tells us here in verse one, the context in which he's writing, but 
as this was written over 2,000 years ago, probably none of any of that just made any sense to you. That's okay. Let's back up. Let's talk about what this means. What is the historical setting of when this story took place? Well, within the larger narrative, the larger story of Scripture, uh, this one's easy to remember. Nehemiah is actually the very last event. It's the very last recorded narrative to take place in the Old Testament. In other words, in the story of Scripture, Nehemiah is the very last part of the narrative before Jesus was to come. I think we have a slide up there to kind of give us some, some more of the context. Um, it's a little small because there's a lot to add into there, but if you could see any of this, this is just a basic timeline of the Old Testament. Um, again, our Bibles divide up Old Testament and New Testament. And um, roughly m- most of the events of Genesis, um, of course, after chapter 12, once we're introduced to Abraham, take place somewhere roughly around 2000 BC. Uh, and then, then fast forward about 500 years or so, and you get to uh, Moses and, and the story of the Exodus, where the Israelites come out of Egypt uh, back to the promised land that God had promised to Abraham. You enter soon into the time of the judges and until about around, again, roughly a thousand BC, and you're we're introduced to the time of the kings. Uh, of Israel. Um, um, and, and that's where we're introduced to David, King, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, around 1000 BC. Of course, if you can see up here, just not too long after that, really after Solomon, it was between, between two of his sons, the kingdom was <clears throat> divided. Uh, Israel was divided into the northern and, and the southern kingdom. And for the next few hundred years, um, Israel was a divided kingdom. And and then the Lord uh, saw fit to, uh, to judge Israel. They, they were not following the covenant and, and, and God sent them many prophets as we can see uh, on the bottom, many of these, uh, actually, I think that's in the next slide, but, but um, and we see right around uh, seven, close to 700 BC, the Northern kingdom of Israel was attacked, was destroyed by the Assyrians. And then just around, right around 600 BC, about 600 years before Jesus, uh, the southern kingdom where Jerusalem was, the capital, was, was ransacked, was attacked, and many were taken captive um, by the Babylonian army. So, um, so, so Babylon, after Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, while well, many remained in Israel, in the ruined city of Israel, uh, or, uh, of Jerusalem, sorry, um, many of the Jews were taken captive back to Babylon. This is where we get the book of uh, Daniel, for example, one of those who was taken captive and lived in Babylon. So about 70 years after, uh, uh, 70 years of captivity, uh, the Persian army came and defeated the Babylonians. And the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, the Bible tells us, gave the Jews permission to return home again to Israel. However, with Babylon being their home for about 70 years, for many of the Jews, Babylon was now all they knew of home. Particularly for those born in captivity, Babylon was where they had their lives now. It was was where they had their jobs, their families. So while many went back to Israel over the next several decades and around 500 BC or so, Many of the Jews stayed, such as uh, Esther, for example. If you know the story of Esther, this is where she comes in. She was one of the Jews who stayed in uh, the kingdom of Persia, and later Esther became the queen of Persia. The Jew Esther, if you know the story, she married uh, the Persian king known as Xerxes I, uh, famous actually in in secular history as the uh, king who... um, had a camp, famous war campaign against Greece in the Battle of uh, Thermopylae around 480 BC. But the next king, his son, named Artaxerxes I, took the throne around 464 BC. And so verse 1 of Nehemiah, you're like, that's a lot of background. Okay, we're caught up to Nehemiah 1. Verse 1 of Nehemiah tells us that Nehemiah was writing in the 20th year, he says in verse 1, And what he means by the 20th year is the 20th year of the reign of this king, Artaxerxes I. 
which would have been sometime around 444 BC. So, Nehemiah was one of these Jews who was born, who was raised in the Persian Empire, who never returned home after the exile and, and the captivity. Verse 1 specific, says specifically he was writing from the citadel, which means a fortress named Asusa, uh, which was in Persia. Okay, I hope I didn't lose you there. A lot of context, uh, because we're going to be in this book for a few months. I want to give you that context. But now with that context, look with me at verses 2 and 3. Why is he writing this? Well, it says, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Verse three, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So one of Nehemiah's brothers traveled from Persia to Judah, uh, which by the way is another name for the southern kingdom of Israel where Jerusalem was. And, and he says they particularly traveled to that capital city of Jerusalem to see what it was like there. And upon the return, Nehemiah wanted to know, hey, what's the condition of, of, of the capital city? What's the condition of, of, of these people who came back from exile? Are, are they thriving in the land. But the report Nehemiah received was not good. It says the walls of the city were broken, the gates of the city had been burned, leaving its people unprotected and vulnerable to attack. Nehemiah discovered in this report that while many of God's people had returned to the promised land, they were still not living the promised life. Their capital city of Jerusalem lay defenseless and in ruin. So look at Nehemiah's response in verse 4. He said, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant, Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant, Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They're your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and mighty hand. Nehemiah, upon hearing the current state of God's people and their city is broken by this news. So much so that he falls to the ground in tears. For many days he prayed, he fasted for God's intervention. And for many months, according to verse one of chapter two, he mourned this news. Verses five to 10 give us a, a summary of what Nehemiah prayed over these months. And notice he first expresses personal responsibility and, and, and repentance for the sin of his people as the reason why the city lay in ruin. 
But then he claims God's promises. He says, God, I know you're, you told us, you promised us you would scatter us among the nations, that, that we would be taken captive, that we wouldn't be able to stay in the promised land if we were unfaithful to you. But, but then he says, but God, you, you also promised us that if we repented, if we came back to you, that you would restore us truly. He was recognizing that, yes, they had been restored back to the land, but, but, but that there was so much more implied in that, that the blessings of God upon them as a people were not fully restored. And then finally, look at verse 11. He says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. He says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Then he says, I was cup bearer to the king. Nehemiah ends his prayer in, in verse 11, foreshadowing the events of the next chapter, which we'll dive into more of the details next week. But notice that he asks God for success for a task he was soon about to do. Specifically, he asked God for favor, for compassion in the presence of a certain man to which he alludes to in the next sentence, the king of Persia. So first in his prayer, he asks God for help for the people of Israel more generally, which is important. But then he ends his prayer with a specific request from God, more specifically as he prepares for an audience with the king in the hope of helping Jerusalem once again to thrive. Now next week, we'll get more into the specifics, into the details of Nehemiah's petition. But for the next few minutes, as we begin to, begin to ponder this question together of how can we as a church thrive, I want you to notice with me this morning three, from Nehemiah's example, three key elements of a posture to thrive. Three elements for Nehemiah's example of a posture to thrive. Number one is hearts that are broken over the need. Hearts that are broken over the need. Look back at verse four again. He said, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Upon hearing the walls were still broken, Nehemiah became broken himself. By Nehemiah's day, God's people had been allowed back into the land for nearly a hundred years. Yet the walls of Jerusalem lay in ruin. This begs the question, why hadn't the walls been rebuilt by this time? Well, the book of Ezra tells us a story uh, in Ezra 4. It tells us that about 10 years before this, uh, that, that the walls, a group of Jews who had returned from the exile, did attempt to build the wall again. However, there was a group of Jews who weren't a part of the exile, who had been living in Jerusalem for, for all this, this time, who opposed their work, and who persuaded the king that rebuilding the city was a threat to his kingdom and to decree for them to stop the work. Ezra 4.23 says, As soon as the copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rahum and, and Shimshai, the secretary and their associates, it says they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them to stop by force. So it was either at that time that, or, or perhaps it was later by an invading army that what was what had begun 10 years earlier to be built of the walls and the gates of the city were torn down and burned. The news that which had just reached Nehemiah for the first time. So notice by the time of Nehemiah, 
there were two positions in Jerusalem concerning the rebuilding of the wall. First, there were those who knew the wall needed to be rebuilt and wanted the wall to be rebuilt, but they felt defeated and had given up trying. Secondly, there were those who were opposed to the wall being rebuilt. After nearly 150 years without having any walls, many of the citizens of Jerusalem became complacent. They got used to things the way they were and they didn't want things to change. Like the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, as we saw a few weeks ago, during the time of Jesus, out of a fear of losing their power that they had, they felt threatened by the presence of Jesus, someone new who was coming in to make uh, changes to how things were and how things had been. So rather than seeing the walls built and their city's defenses and glory restored, they let the walls crumble and the gates rot. The question is, as we read this passage together and we seek to apply it to us as a church today, is are you broken? Are you broken about the need here for us to thrive? Or have you become complacent? I'm asking, does your heart break? Do you burn with passion over the fact that there are a million people here in Gwinnett County within a 30 minute drive from this church? Most of whom are lost and separated from God for eternity. And here we have this huge facility with so many empty seats around us, next to us. And we're struggling to get 100 people here every Sunday. I'm asking, do you mourn? Do you ache? Do you stay up at night, lying in bed, thinking, wrestling with, how in the world are we going to rebuild our church? How can we do a better job at reaching the lost in this community for Jesus? Or have you become discouraged? Or complacent? and lost your urgency. As we were researching, possibly merging with other churches or potentially selling our building and replanting, one of our longtime members here was a part of those discussions, went to visit a larger church, a growing Southern Baptist church in our county. He wanted to visit, wanted to research and get ideas. And they told me as they sat through the worship service, And they saw hundreds of people come to gather, young and old. People that looked like they belonged in church, so to speak, and those who didn't quite fit the mold of a churchgoer. All races, personalities, and backgrounds, as as hundreds of people filled up that that auditorium to hear the word together, to, to gather together to worship, this member of our church said it so moved them that they began to get emotional and, and to tear up. And they told me the reason they, they, they said they realized the reason they were they were getting so emotional was they said it. They didn't realize how long it had been since they had attended a church. Since they had attended a church that was truly healthy. See, the reality is over time, it's, it's easy to just get used to things the way they are so that it comes to a point that we no longer see the need or even want anything to change. Sometimes, as with the story of Nehemiah, 
It takes an outside. It takes a fresh perspective. Someone stirring the people up to see the need again, to help remind God's people what it truly is to thrive. By the way, don't take my word for it. Here's a really helpful way for you. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor Matt? I I don't know. I, I just don't see what you're saying. Here's for the longtime members here. Let me give you a very practical way to see what I'm talking about, to, to get that outside perspective. For those of you with kids, many in here with kids and with grandkids, but they don't want to attend here. Ask them why. Ask them why. We have many, many here who attend here but the younger generations, they don't want to come. I'm just saying it's a very easy, very helpful way if you want to get that outside perspective to be able to see outside of our lens. Do you feel an urgency? Do you understand the need for us to rebuild in order to thrive? Or rather, have you become comfortable used to things the way they are, even to the point where you've become opposed to change. I want to be very clear. What I'm saying is that every system that is built gets the exact results that that system was built to get. Meaning that if we want to continue down the same trajectory that we've been moving towards as a church for the past few decades, then by all means, let's keep doing what we've been doing. But if we want to reach people in our community that we are not preaching, if we want to change our trajectory as a church, if we want to get different results than what we've been getting we have to do some rebuilding. What I'm asking you this morning is, are you more bothered about a change in the music, a change church carpet, a change in the church name, than you are burdened about the hearts of the lost in the city being changed by the power of the gospel? Notice that Nehemiah's heart was filled with a burden to the point of moving him to tears for people whom he had never even met. Church, can I ask you, is your heart burdened for the lost in our city who could be sitting on the pew right next to you hearing the word. Is your heart burdened for those whom you have never met who our church is currently not reaching? Or have you become complacent, opposed to change? The first element of a posture to thrive is hearts that are broken over the need. Number two, is hands that are bold to sacrifice. Look with me back at verse 11. Look at the second half. He said, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. As we mentioned earlier, this last portion of Nehemiah's prayer is for God's favor and seeking an audience with the king. Nehemiah knew that if he was to have any success at helping Israel to thrive, then King Artaxerxes would need to overturn his decree from 10 years earlier. But if you remember in the story of Esther, to make such a request of the Persian king was a highly dangerous task. 
Esther 4.11 says, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. They be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their life. If you remember, we saw this played out in the story of Esther, where she approaches the king two different times to invite him to a banquet, risking her life, and he extends the golden scepter to her. Nehemiah knew that he had to somehow persuade the king for him to even approach him and with a request without the king approaching him first would have most likely meant his death. What that means is to do what was necessary to help Israel thrive once again, Nehemiah would quite literally be risking his own neck. And then beyond that, look at verse 11 again. He says in the last phrase, he says, I was cupbearer to the king. Now, royal cupbearers in the ancient world, in addition to their skill in selecting and serving wine and tasting it against poison, they were also expected to be close and tactful companions to the king. Uh, being much in the king's confidence, they were, could yield uh, wield considerable influence by the way of, of informal counsel and, and discussion, being in the king's uh, chambers. And Nehemiah hoped to use this influence to be able to reverse the king's earlier decree, as we'll see in chapter two next week. But I want you to notice that even if Nehemiah was successful at his task, Not only was Nehemiah risking uh, uh, his life to speak with the king, but even if his requests were granted, it would mean that Nehemiah would be giving up his exalted status as one of the most important men in the strongest empire in the world. Just for him to throw in his lot with the people of the Jews in the remote and insignificant, broken down city of Jerusalem. Imagine, for example, holding a position in the U.S. government where you were respected, you were well provided for, you you wielded a large amount of influence that you had worked for for years to get. But with your grandparents being from Ukraine and, and, and having Ukrainian blood in you, you're so moved to defend your country that you resign from your position here, your position of power and influence and wealth, and you, you move to Ukraine to fight on the front lines for her freedom. So if, if everything went favorable with Nehemiah's request to the king and he doesn't die, this is essentially what Nehemiah would be doing. In other words, Nehemiah was not only stirred emotionally by the need to thrive, but he was also willing to sacrifice physically for them to thrive. The question for each of us as members is, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to to give up? in order for us to thrive as a church. I don't doubt that everybody in this room would would say that they want our church to grow and, and that they would mean it probably. Maybe you even feel strongly about it, like like you're moved emotionally about it, that you want our church to grow so bad that, that you want our church to reach more people for Jesus see, while everybody wants the church to grow, usually not everybody is willing to endure the growing pains that come with it. Again, whenever growth occurs, it happens because a change occurred. Most people don't like change, however, because change equals loss. We always lose something that was there before when there is a change. And so that loss causes us pain. So so growth equals change, and then change equals 
loss and loss equals pain. What does that mean? That means growth equals pain. In other words, growing as a church will be painful. It's inevitable. However, what is also inevitable, as we said earlier, is that if we don't change and if we don't grow, that, sorry, that if we don't change, we won't grow. Uh, the pastor of the church I attended during my college years used to remind us that the church, he used to remind the church there continuously uh, as they would, they would introduce new changes, they would introduce new initiatives constantly for the church every single year to, to reach new people they weren't reaching. They, would, they were constantly introducing initiatives and he would remind the church with this phrase that a growing church is a church in transition. In other words, if, if you want to stay as a stagnant church, maybe we keep doing the same things you did the year, year after year, the same thing you did the year before, let's do it again. But if you want to grow, then constant change is inevitable. In fact, many of you would know Pastor Frank Cox, pastor of North Metro Baptist Church here in Gwinnett. And he told me this, we had lunch a few months ago. He said, statistically, churches that are most successful and continue to grow, not just year after year, but decade after decade, he told me this. He said, they are churches which completely reinvent themselves about every 10 years. Now, the reason for this, he explained, is twofold. Number one, is that Christians tend to get stagnant. We tend to get comfortable in our routines where we end up after a while just going through the motions of ministry and church without really stopping much to think about why we're doing what we're doing. But then the second reason, the more important reason, is that the culture and the world around us is, is rapidly changing. In fact, now in the last 50 to 100 years, uh, really the last 20 years, our, our culture is changing, not even generation by generation or century by century. No, it's, it's almost every year where rapid changes are happening because of communication. And, 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 so, and so if we don't change, we're not going to reach the people. If we're not ourselves also changing the way we communicate, by the way, let me be very clear, what I don't mean is changing our message. What I don't mean is changing our doctrine like many churches do. That's not what we're talking about. What it means is that if we truly want to connect with and reach the people in our city, then we just can't have the mindset of, well, this is just how we've always done things here. That's the sentence that kills church. Well, this is just how we've always done things. And then we do the things in the future just because that's the way things were done in the past because why? They're comfortable for us. But just because they're comfortable for us, guess who they're often not comfortable to? The guests who walk in our doors. The people in our church who don't want to come because they, and so, so instead we must be con constantly recontextualizing in our culture as to how we can better connect with and communicate with the lost in our city. Being a, in a church that's always changing things up because we're always growing and, and changing more things up the next year to grow even more. It's not very comfortable. Let's just lay that on the table. It is what it is. It's not very comfortable because growth equals pain. But you know, it wasn't very comfortable either. That wasn't very comfortable. Why did Jesus do it? Why did Jesus endure the pain of death on the cross? 
so we can have life. Paul likewise said, hey, I have become all things to all people that by all possible means I might save some. Paul's like, I'll do anything. Man, Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was stoned. He said he went without food. He went without clothes at times. I mean, Paul, he, he came so close to death and endured so much pain. Why? He said that I just might win some. He said, I'll do it for one. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. What about you? What are you willing to sacrifice like Jesus did for you? For the church to grow and to thrive so others in the city outside these walls right now might be saved. The second element of a posture to thrive is hands that are bold in sacrifice. Posture number three is this. It's heads that are bowed in prayer. Heads that are bowed in prayer. Look with me at verse four one more time. Nehemiah 1 verse 4. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Yes, Nehemiah mourned Israel's situation. In fact, he was so deeply moved in his heart that he was determined. He said, I'm gonna, I need to do something about this. And, and he began devising a plan to, to help but more importantly than any of that, before he attempted to do anything, Nehemiah prayed. Based on the date given that we'll look at next week in chapter 2, verse 1, for about four months, Nehemiah mourned and he fasted and he prayed for the people of Israel. Now, this period of waiting upon God and praying isn't a sign of, of fear. It's not a sign of weakness on Nehemiah's part. In fact, from the rest of the story, we know that we know that he was a dynamic man of action. See, before he acted, Nehemiah needed to know that God would act, that God would open the door for him to go before him to follow. As influential and as mighty a man as Nehemiah was, he didn't rely on his own prowess, on his own strength to accomplish this task, but he recognized that for him, for this to be successful, that God must work. And the fact is that if we ever want to truly thrive as a church. Again, we want to see the people, we want to take down these barriers to these pews once again. We want to see the balcony filled up. We want to see our choir filled up again. God must work. As much as we can exert ourselves into the work of the ministry, we can, we can scream, we can grunt and cry trying to build the church Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 16 again. He said, I will build my church. At the end of the day, as much as, as, much as we have been given in the calling of, of uh, resp then the responsibility to, to till the ground, to, to sow the seed and, and to water, it's, Jesus, that must, that, that must bring the harvest. It's only Jesus that can produce the fruit at the end of the day. So if we want to see fruit here at Calvary, we must pray and ask God to do what only he can do. Jefferson, my four-year-old, 
loves to tinker with and build things. So a few weeks ago, we got him a, a marble run. It's like, a, it has a bunch of these tubes. It has these slides you could put together and, and, and build and then in however way you want. And you put marbles down it and it kind of goes through the, the tubes and, and uh, you watch the marbles roll. Jefferson loves it. Well, the first day, first day we got it, we got it nighttime right before we came home. And I stayed up till about one in the morning putting this uh, marble run together for Jefferson to enjoy in the morning. Of course, before I could even drink my coffee the next morning and watch him play with it, Jefferson had already taken the whole thing and, and, and tore it apart and, and rebuilt it uh, how he liked it. The problem was there were some parts of building it, which is why I was up till one in the morning, uh, trying to figure it out. There were some parts that were pretty difficult, right? There was this like chain link elevator thing that, that runs on power and it was a little complicated and, and Jefferson couldn't figure out how to do it. So I sat there drinking my coffee and, and watched him as, as he screamed, as he, he gets frustrated and he got angry and he started crying, trying to build it on his own. So I finally looked at him and said, Jefferson, as I've said to him so many times before, you know, all you have to do is ask and I'll help you build it. I wonder how often we as Christians struggle in frustration and we strive in, in, in ministry to do the work of the Lord and we grunt and scream and cry all the while, Jesus is looking at us and trying to tell us, hey, all you have to do is ask. I'll build it. That's what he told us in Matthew 7, verse 7. He said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So let's ask. God wants to bless our church. He wants to see us thrive. There's no doubt about it. He wants the church, our church, to grow, to reach more people in our community, the lost with the gospel of Jesus. But have we been asking him for? This is the reason I chose prayer to be the subject of our conference last month, because if we have any chance to thrive again as a church, we must ask God for help. So for this reason, starting next Sunday morning, for the next three months, all the way through June, we're going to have a prayer meeting. Every Sunday morning, right here in the worship center, it's going to be short from 9.15 to 9.30. We're going to meet right here in the worship center. Worship practice is going to end by 9.15. And you are invited, anyone is invited to come to this prayer meeting. Again, 9.15, starting next Sunday, right here. And any, anyone, any age can come to this. And we're just going to pray every, every week, every morning on Sundays. We're going to ask the Lord and seek him that we may thrive. Would you pray with me for that right now? Lord, we can do nothing apart from you that's worth anything, and we don't want to do anything apart from you. I pray that we would thrive as a church. Lord, we don't ask it for ourselves. We don't ask it because we will enjoy it because we know it's going to be painful. We know it's going to take sacrifice as you sacrifice for us. But we ask it for your glory. Lord, that your blood you shed on the cross for us be so effective in our community, Lord, that all may be known 
in you that all here in Lilburn may know you as their Savior. Help us, Lord. We ask this in your holy name of Jesus. Amen.